please. Um, okay, uh, good, uh, what? good evening, it's 7 p.m. Cairo local time. Today is the event for the second live webinar presented by Bahia Hospital. Bahia is a non-profitable organization that was initiated on 2015, and since then it has served a total of about 140,000 Egyptian females at the Centers of Excellence that provided all the facilities and investigations for the early detection of breast cancer regarding laboratory, radiological, pathological, and integrated management of surgery, medical oncology, radiotherapy, and supportive treatment. The current webinar will focus on the modern breast imaging techniques sponsored by the company Global Technology Fujifilm. There will be a set of two sessions. The first one will be presented by the invited American professor, Dr. Jessica Long that will talk about the breast tomosensis from 7 to 7.45 p.m. And then will be followed by another session that will be driven by the professor, Egyptian professor, Dr. Rasha Kamal, that will talk about the behavior, Bahia's experience in the field of functional breast imaging uh, from 8 to 8.45 p.m. Kindly be aware that questions are not allowed during the active passage of the sessions. However, feel free to submit all your inquiries in the chat window that will be discussed later on after the end of the session. I am very honored to introduce Professor Jessica Long because it is the most popular professor uh, for the Egyptian community of breast imaging. Uh, actually, she is the professor of diagnostic imaging uh, at the University of Texas and the Anderson Cancer Center, and she is the deputy chief of the Department of Breast Imaging. She was the first woman to be awarded for the William L. Thomas Scholar for the Academic Achievement by the Harvard Club and the Dutcher Prize for the Top 50 Academic Performance. Professor Long's presentation is entitled Breast, Di Digital Breast Tomosensis, Masses, Asymmetries, Distribution in the Screening and Diagnostic Setting. Welcome, Dr. Jessica. We'll start now. Thank you everybody for the opportunity to present here. And I'm going to wait until the IT uh, start my video because um, it says that I cannot start my own video. Okay. There we go. I think we're okay now. Yes. Um, thank you, Dr. Sahar for this opportunity. I would like to thank the Bayer Foundation uh, for inviting me and of course for what you do in terms of early detection and treatment for breast cancer. It's been my long honor to be involved with learning, with education, with friendship, with the breast cancer, breast imaging community of Cairo. And i uh, like to especially thank my uh, colleague and friend, Professor Rasha Kamel for years of support and also for this opportunity again. So I would like to now start by sharing my screen and um, Let me see how to do that. I will now share my screen. Can my, see, can my screen be seen okay right now, everybody? Yes, yes it's, it's actually sure, Dr. Jessica. All right, wonderful. Um, title of my lecture is digital breast tomosynthesis, masses, asymmetries, distortions in the screening and diagnostic settings. I am a breast imager at the MD Anderson Cancer Center, University of Texas in Houston, Texas. And for the year of 2020, I also have another role, which is being the president of the Society of Breast Imaging here in the United States. I'd just like to take a minute before I go to my lecture to say that Society of Breast Imaging welcomes our international members. We welcome you to join our group. We will have a virtual symposium on April 9 to 11 in the year 2021. 
virtual instead of in person, of course, as we all know in this era of COVID-19 pandemic currently going on. The theme of the symposium will be to optimize and innovate. And quickly is that uh, the registration fee will be complimentary, meaning free of charge to our international members. And there will be a whole other areas of possibility of involvement as listed here. I won't take much time to go into each of them, but suffice it to say, both opportunities to network with each other, with industry, scientific abstracts, didactic education sessions, et cetera. And along with a whole bunch of other international member benefits. So anybody interested, please feel free to contact me. So on that note, I am going to start with the lecture. And the overview of the lecture is as following. I'm first going to start with the background on tomosynthesis, which involves a little bit of the significance of dense breasts, followed by how has tomosynthesis impacted the clinical practice of breast imaging, going from the screening to the diagnostic setting. And with that, I will talk about each lesion in turn. And remember, for the purpose of this lecture, we have three categories of lesions, and they are mass, Asymmetries, and a little bit of a preview is that when we say asymmetries, using the BIRAS lexicon, we have four types of asymmetries, and that is the asymmetry, the global asymmetry, the focal asymmetry, and the developing asymmetry. And lastly, architecture distortion before we conclude our lecture. So to start out with kind of the background, we know that dense breasts is a challenge uh, to us in breast imaging. What I have shown here are MLO mammograms going from BIRAD's density categories A to B to C to D. That is your primarily fatty breast on the left-hand side to your extremely dense breasts on your right-hand side. Now, while these are in four distinct categories, we know that going from fatty to dense breast is a spectrum. And as we go from A to B, we go from fatty to dense. And in terms of what's called fatty and dense, A and B are considered fatty and C and D are considered dense. Now breast density plays a role in both the false positive and the false negative aspects of mammography. We're gonna start talking about first the false negative and then the false positives, if you will. Now what false positives mean is that when you have a mammogram, which is a 2D depiction, you have a breast that is a 3D structure with volume and the overlapping breast tissues are stacked on top of each other. And when that happens, you can have crossing of tissue, crossing of breast fibers that mimic a cancer, right? That's not a cancer, but it can mimic a cancer. That's what you call a false positive. False negative is when you have dense breast tissue that hide cancers. And a simple way of thinking about it is that breast cancers in general on mammogram looks white. White against white is hard to see because dense tissue is white. So the cancer that appears white is obscured by dense tissue that also appears white. So therefore hard to see. This is the so-called masking effect. The cancer is being masked by the dense tissue that is of the same attenuation. Another way of thinking about this is a polar bear, which is very, uh, with the white fur, lost in a snowstorm, which is also white. So to introduce our audience to the polar bear, I'm showing you here, I think this is a, a mother bear and her baby cub along in this snowy environment. And because of the color similarities here between the fur and the snow, it could be difficult to see. Just like a cancer that is white, in dense tissue that is white could give rise to false negatives. Now, how does tomosynthesis help us? I know many of you in the audience use tomosynthesis on everyday term, and that instead of a 2D depiction of a 3D structure, we now have single slices that are thin. And because of that, we think that recall rates can be decreased because you can eliminate overlapping structures. Superimposition of fibroglandular structures can now be delineated and that we are no longer fooled as often into thinking that they are real lesions. 
Also, by having single slices instead of a thick volumetric slab, you can have increase in cancer detection uh, because you overlapping tissues are more commonly removed. And both of these, of course, are good things, right? Decreasing recall rate and increasing cancer detection. Let me show you one example. These are single slices of a tomosynthesis series. And what you have on the left is MLO and the CC from a screening exam. And I'm just gonna show you this structure here shown in the yellow circle. And there it is on the CC in the lateral aspect, photographically enlarged, it looks like that on the left and that on the right-hand side, MLO and CC. And what is this? Well, we readily recognize that this is an oval or reniform shape. There is a notch, a fatty hilum, and this is very classic for an intramammary lymph node, BIRATS2 benign. And no, this is not a cancer, but this demonstrates how beautifully lesions or findings can be depicted with tomosynthesis in terms of the margin shape. And therefore, uh, it will allow us to more confidently say it is okay without a recall, decreasing recall rate. And should this be a cancer, uh, we will see the spicules and the irregularity more and therefore pick up more cancers as well. So both decrease recall rate and increase cancer detection. Which brings me to this chocolate cake. Uh, it's uh, after seven o'clock. Some of you may have had dinner or looking forward to dinner. Uh, and that uh, most of us like having chocolate cake. And the idea is to have a cake that is good tasting and no calories, or at least less calories, right? That is all our desire, my desire too. And I like to bring this picture up because we can kind of think of tomosynthesis as achieving that. Good tasting chocolate cake with less calories because with tomosynthesis and with removal of overlapping tissues, with these single slices, it is possible that we have increased cancer detection and decreased recall rates. So therefore helping with the problems of false negatives and false positives, which is good. So this is a good thing and this is desirable. So with that as background, we're going to jump into the masses, asymmetries and distortions with tomosynthesis. Now, just a little bit of clarity for the rest of this lecture. You're going to see these terms 2D means a conventional mammogram. You may also see digital mammography or DM, or some investigators and some publications will say full field digital mammography, FFDM. So that means the 2D mammogram. In contrast to tomosynthesis, some we may refer it to as tomo or the whole word tomosynthesis or DBT, which stands for digital breast tomosynthesis. And lastly, you may see the words S2D, which stands for the synthetic mammogram or the synthesized mammogram. And I use the word synthetic. Some individuals use the word synthesized, but basically this is a 2D rendering made from the tomosynthesis slices. So I just wanna talk about a little bit of that as a background before jumping into the discussion on masses, asymmetries and distortions. Now, how does tomosynthesis work uh, add to 2D? I mean, I, we know that it's like our chocolate cake, decrease recall rate, increase, increase cancer detection, that is helping with both false positive and false negatives of mammography due to the density of the breasts. Now, we can also think of it as another way is that it allows us to see more and therefore achieve those concepts. It allows us to see more in terms of number of lesions, size of lesions, location of lesions, because of all that tomosynthesis can offer. It allows us to see clearer, right, by over removing the overlapping tissue, helping us to determine shape margin better than a conventional 2D many times. And it allows us to see smarter. That is, help us to distinguish between what is real and what is not what is superimposition of fibroglandular structures versus a true lesion. Now, a true lesion doesn't have to be a cancer, but a true lesion like a fibroadenoma, for example, that's a true lesion. And of course, you have cancers there too. So tomosynthesis versus 2D, see more, see clearer, and see smarter. So I want you to bring these concepts, uh, keep them in your mind as we go to discuss screening to the diagnostic setting. 
Okay, let's look at one example of some of the tools we have. What you have on this is a CC mammogram, and this is a 2D mammogram. And what we have is something here, relatively low density, so it doesn't stand out that much against the background, which is primarily fatty in this area. Let me show this to you photographically in large. You can see, you know, there may be a lesion. It looks, doesn't really look like superimposition of structures. Maybe there's a bit of margin about here. So this is the photographically enlarged image 2D. Now, some of the techniques we have is spot compression view. And this is a synthetic 2D spot compression made from a Tomo series that is of spot compression. And I picked out the sort of most uh, representative image to show you. And you can see, mm, um, I think there is, could potentially be a mass, but I think this image probably shows it the best, which is a single slice from the Tomo spot compression to show you, ah, I do think there is a mass. Uh, doesn't mean that this has to be a cancer, but that this is a true lesion. So just some examples to show you the different imaging modality and tools that we have to help us uh, find cancers. And in this particular case, it happens to be a cyst. Um, here it is, right breast two o'clock, and I'm showing this to you in the transverse and longitudinal plane. So this is a cyst, a mass, that's seen on mammal, tomo, spot tomo, and ultrasound, and it turns out to be a cyst. Okay, uh, I know we're talking about masses, asymmetries, and distortions, but let me just show you a little bit of what else Tomo can do to help us uh, going from the screening to the diagnostic setting. So MLO and CC on your right, these are 2D mammograms. So something on the inferior posterior and medial posterior that caught my attention as I was reading this screening mammogram. I'll show them to you bigger. Can you see a little bit of calcifications here? And also here, medially, okay. So I was really, really close to saying, well, I'm not sure that they're benign. I'm not sure that, you know, they are um, vascular or any kind of definite benign calcifications. I didn't really see them on the prior years. So I was close to recalling them for magnification views. Do we need to do that is the question. And um, at the end of the day, the TOMO helped me to say, no, we do not need to. And this is why. Here we have the TOMO slice, and we're looking at that area there in the medial posterior breast on the CC. And let me show them to you bigger. You see these? And it happens that this is a TOMO slice one out of 58, which tells me in our denotation that because it's slice one, it is in the skin. Okay. And in our institution, this would mean the most inferior part of the breast. So this is skin calcifications, biorats to benign, seen as screening. I do not need to recall this patient for diagnostic imaging. And similarly, to show you the different modalities, here we have on the left a 2D. Here we have in the middle a synthetic. And then the right, which is uh, the DBT or digital breast tomosynthesis slice. I am pointing arrows to linear calcifications, lining a tubular structure, which are representative of BIRADS to vascular calcifications. Why I like to show this case is because, not so much because we see the calcification so much better, but because we see the tubular structure better than I think on the 2D, which gives me confidence that these, these are lining the tubular structure and that the tubular structure is the vessel and therefore confidently say BIRADS to benign no need to recall for diagnostic. Now, okay, how has breast imaging practice been impacted downstream from screening with tomosynthesis? Meaning you do tomo in the screening setting now. How has it impacted our need for diagnostic mammography? So let me show you some data from a uh, analysis of a lot of numbers from two healthcare systems between the years of 2015 to 2017, when tomosynthesis was, was implemented into the screening program. So the results were published in 2019 and it involved over 300,000 screening mammogram exams. So a lot of data to look at. And these are the results uh, from that analysis. So just to point your attention, what you have here in this column is DBT, which is digital breast tomosynthesis. What you have in the middle column here is DM or digital mammography, the 2D. So just to point your attention to some key numbers here, cancer detection rate per 1,000 women screen. 
The idea is that 2D was 3.8 watt per 1,000, with Tomo was 4.8, which means there is improvement. And this improvement was statistically significant because the p-value was less than 0.05. So this is good. And Tomo did what it was supposed to do. That is, it increased cancer detection. Another number to look at from this analysis of 325,000 or so uh, exams is the PPV1 defined as the number of cancer de detected per recall. And also you can see that it's improved going from 3.5 to 5.4, going from 2D to TOMO. And this is also good, desirable, statistically significant. And this is an indirect measurement to us that yes, finding more cancers and uh, reducing the recall, right? Because this is a, a, a fraction. So this is also a positive change and also something that uh, we expect from what we know about tomosynthesis and what we have seen in other publications. Interesting is that this article showed what I just discussed, but it also looks at the most common diagnostic pathways within 90 days following a BIRAD zero, okay? Um, and the gray color is when you screen with 2D versus the black color is when you screen with TOMO. And I thought the interesting point to learn from this chart is this, which is ultrasound. Um, and the fact that the first step as the initial workup of using ultrasound has increased when you have tomosynthesis, which means to us, indirectly at least, that tomo perhaps can answer some or many questions that diagnostic mammogram used to answer so that instead of doing more diagnostic mammogram like spot compression views, we may be able to go directly to ultrasound. That's what uh, I conclude. And I'm gonna talk about the next thing, which is the BIRATS, um, a companion piece, if you will. So just to review is that BIRATS stands for Breast Imaging Reporting and Data System. And this is the most current edition, which is the fifth edition, copyrighted in 2013, when we have mammogram, ultrasound, and MR. There was no TOMO discussion yet. Uh, but in March of 2019, there, came out a supplement to the BIRADS lexicon, which is a supplement on digital breast tomosynthesis guidance. Many of the concepts discussed were similar to what you already know for 2D MAMO. I would like to bring up sort of the one difference, if you will, or the one addition, and this is the following paragraph. Additional mammographic imaging workup. Because DBT often confirms the veracity of a finding without the need for additional diagnostic mammographic view, Traditional use workup protocols may change. For example, if the margin and location of a mass are well seen on the tomosynthesis images, additional spot compression or magnification views may not be necessary and at recall, the patient may proceed directly to ultrasound. And that is a direct um, uh, paragraph that I took from that supplement in the BIRATS to show you here on this slide. And this is sort of consistent with what we saw in the article I just showed you, that the use of ultrasound as the first step has increased. Now, of course, we're talking about masses, asymmetry distortions, not so much about calcifications. With calcifications, my recommendation is still that you use conventional geometric, the classic 2D magnification views. Okay, so on that note, now we're really going to dive into mass asymmetries distortions. So a review of the mammographic manifestations, calcifications, mass, asymmetry distortions. Those are your big four categories, if you will. And we will focus on the non-calcified lesions, mass, asymmetries, and distortions for the rest of this lecture. So mass, what is a mass? Well, a mass is a space occupying lesion with three dimensionality. It is densest at the center, widest on a mammogram in the center as opposed to the periphery of the mass. The margins are convex in words, not concave. And it is characterized by the descriptors of shape and margin. Often you can see a correlate at ultrasound. I would say usually you would see a correlate at ultrasound, not 100% of the time, but usually. 
and that is the mass. Let me show you some examples of mass. Okay. So these are your um, mammograms, MLO and CC. These are 2D, and this is suggestion of a mass and a mass. And there's another mask there on the left breast in the MLO there with the red circle in the upper and then in the outer. So these, I said 2D, but I believe they're actually synthetic 2D, which means that I recreated it from the uh, tomosynthesis series, which means I have a tomosynthesis. So these are the tomosynthesis images, single slices I am showing for the purpose of this lecture. So let's look at that left breast first, you know, where the red circles were. Okay, although there are masses in both breasts. And when you look at the tomosynthesis series on the left breast, MLO on your left-hand side, CC on your right, what you see is this upper mid portion. And then this is what it looks like photographically enlarged. And then here in the lateral or outer on the CC, and here it is photographically enlarged. My point here is that you see it very nicely. Again, shape margin. And you see the variation between the density so that you have the fatty part and the denser part. Uh, this is something I've already shown you before. Uh, this is a BIRADS 2 benign intramammary lymph node, another one, you know. Uh, they're common as we know at mammography. Notice that the location is that this is image 4 of 45 on the MLO, CC was 23 of 44. And with these denotations uh, in our system, this tells us that this is in the upper outer breast, more outer than up the, uh, quite outer. That's why it's image number four, you know, the beginning of the series. And this all makes sense. Upper outer intramammary lymph node, uh, see it well, a uh, benign BIRADS2, no need for additional um, workup. So let's look at the other side now, which is the right breast. Remember we have this mass here shown in the yellow circle anteriorly. And that's what that looks like. And you see the beautiful circumscribed aspect of it. It's oval shape, we see that nicely. And without spot compression view, we can even see that this is really nicely circumscribed, suggesting to us that whatever this is, it is benign. Um, here it is very close to the skin here. And that's what that looks like on the CC laterally. Again, most of it is circumscribed. And the MLO shows a beautiful circumscribed margin. Now, the um, interesting thing from this is that on the MLO, this was image one of 41. So very, very, very lateral. And indeed, this tells us that this is a skin lesion, by rat, and therefore by rats to benign. Okay. And I show that to say, well, this is not classic for an intramammary lymph node that we can say by rats too. Uh, the cancers usually are not circumscribed, but of course you can have circumscribed cancers. But in this case, we know it's not because we know it is located in image one which means it's in the skin and therefore by rats to benign. So that's how um, at screening TOMO, we were able to avoid the need for diagnostic workup. Now in contrast, let's look at this mass. This is a, yet another mass and I'm showing you the ultrasound and the MRI first of the mass to demonstrate, you know, you can see the correlate at ultrasound, which most masses you can, and you can even see it on MR right there as an enhancing lesion. This, of course, shows margins that are irregular, maybe even some spicules. And at ultrasound, maybe you have some post posterior acoustic shadowing. The margins are indistinct. This is a suspicious finding. Uh, and at ultrasound guide guided core biopsy, this turned out to be an invasive lobular carcinoma. Okay. So this is not a benign lesion, of course, and you know, fairly classic cancer. Uh, and the reason I want to show you this is just to show you what it looks like on 2D synthetic and then the tomo slice. So these images are after we did the ultrasound data core biopsy demonstrating invasive lobular carcinoma. And um, what we have here at the arrow pointing to is uh, the mass, okay? Something you see in, it has three dimensionality to it and it has con, um, okay, convex margin, excuse me, and characters rise by shape and margin. Everybody see this? Okay, I know it's kind of hard to see, especially broadcasting it on this webinar. So I'm gonna show it to you bigger. So this is the mass. So these are the MLO TOMO images, the CC images. You can see it. I'm going to go back a little bit. It is kind of obscured, you know, by this heterogeneously dense tissue in the background on the 2D and even on the synthetic. But on the TOMO slice, I think is when you can see the shape and the margin the best. So compare this with the synthetic and with the, with the 2D. I'm going to show you just the TOMO. 
and MLO tomo, CC tomo, here they are, enlarged free to see that is still obscured. It's just an obscure lesion, but you can see kind of there is an irregular shape. There are some spicules. I, I think you can see that well, which is of course uh, part of the margin that suggests that it is a by rats four suspicious or even by rats five highly suggestive of malignancy lesion. And again, at ultrasound guided core biops, this mass happens to be an invasive lobular. Okay, so that's the discussion on masses. Let's now move on to talk about asymmetries. We will be using by rats lexicon. The fifth edition is our most current edition. Before that was the fourth edition, which was published 10 years before that in 2003. And I bring up those older editions because to show you the evolution, the changes that has taken place. And the current edition, these are the four lesion types, asymmetry, global asymmetry, focal asymmetry, developing asymmetry within the family of asymmetries. These are the terms correlating in the third edition, which was copyrighted in 1998, a long time ago now, and the fourth edition, which was 2003, okay? So what was what is called asymmetry in the old days was called a density. You should not use the word density anymore to describe an asymmetry because density is now reserved only for discussion of the composition of the breast, primarily fatty, scatter fibrogondular densities, heterogeneously dense or extremely dense. So when you're talking about a lesion type, you shouldn't use density, you should use asymmetry. Then there is the global asymmetry, focal asymmetry, and then this last term of a developing asymmetry. But we're gonna focus first on the top one, which is the asymmetry. And I bring this up to show a little bit of excitement, New York, New York. It is a city and it is a state. And why do I bring that up here? Because the first lesion type is asymmetry. And you also have the category of asymmetries. So I just wanna point that out so we don't get confused. So you can have a lesion type asymmetry within the category of asymmetries, just like you have a New York City within New York State, okay? And that's what this graph shows us, asymmetry as one of the lesion types within the category of asymmetries in the BIRADS lexicon. So on that note, what is an asymmetry? It is basically a one view finding. I, it could be a mass or it could be a focal symmetry, focal asymmetry when you do more workup, but initially it is seen on only one mammography projection. The challenge for this is that what is real and what is not, that's probably the biggest challenge. Uh, what is a true lesion that becomes a mass or a focal asymmetry when you do diagnostic workup, versus overlapping tissues, superimposition of fibroglandular structures or summation artifacts. That reminds me kind of the uh, meat substitutes we have now. Uh, we have commonly in our supermarkets, the Beyond Meat or the Impossible Burger. They're both plant-based burger. Uh, there's been taste tests of those. I have not tried one myself, uh, but I'm looking forward to it. But this is kind of how I think about asymmetries, meaning are they real lesions or are they superimposition of structures? Is it real meat? or is it a plant-based substitute? So you ask yourself uh, in terms of asymmetry, if it is not a real lesion, a summation artifact, then it's really a bi one negative lesion. But if you do think it's a real lesion, then you do a workup and you can actually upgrade it to a mass or at least a focal asymmetry. And there is a term called developing asymmetry, which is basically if you have a lesion that is uh, real, and it is new or increasing. And I'm gonna show some examples of that, okay? And this is important because there are many, many, many uh, times when we see asymmetries and almost always they are nothing. So therefore it is important that we confidently identify them as superimposition only. This is a classic article that was uh, published in 1998 by my mentor, Dr. Sickles from University of California, San Francisco in 1998 radiology. And in this analysis, where he analyzed mammographic uh, findings in one standard projections, he found that greater than 80% of screen detected asymmetries in one view only are summation artifacts. Okay? So of course, we care about false positives as well as false negatives at screening. So the fact that we can say ah, summation only confidently without the need to do additional workup is good because that reduces the false positives of screening mammography. Let's look at an example, MLO on your left and CC on your right. These are 2D mammograms. And what we have is this potential finding. You see that here? 
So that is potentially an, a, a mass, potentially a, a, a focal asymmetry. But at the moment, I can only call it an asymmetry because I only see it on one view, which is the MLO. I don't definitely see anything on the correlating projection here on the CC. You know, I would expect it somewhere along here, kind of mid-death. You know, I don't really see that. So this patient was indeed recalled because I uh, felt suspicious enough. This was the initial finding photographically enlarged. And while it was only seen in one view, it certainly could be, if I do more work up, a lesion that is uh, real and present on another view. But when I recalled her, which is on the right-hand side, I kind of took um, images of the same area, and this is what it looks like basically repeating this MLO. And here, uh, spot compression, I don't see this finding anymore, suggesting that it was effaced with spot compression mammograms and suggesting that this is only summation artifact, superimposition of fibroglandular structures, i.e. by rats one negative. Um, and the reason I bring this up, even though it's not a cancer, is because this is the more common scenario. Greater than 80% of one view findings at uh, screening are just summation artifacts in terms of asymmetry. So you want to be able to know how to diagnose these, how to work these up at least. So that's an asymmetry, okay? Uh, of course, some asymmetries, uh, a small percentage do become cancers and that's why we have to think about each and every one in turn. But just remember that most of them are superimposition of fibroglandular structures. Now, global asymmetry is essentially a benign finding, essentially. Oh, in the older days, it was called asymmetric breast tissue. So what this means is you have asymmetric tissue in one breast more than the other, and it occupies more in one quadrant when compared to the other. And here we have, and these are relatively dense breasts, very dense breasts actually, and your global asymmetry is on this side, okay, which is the left side on the MLO and on the CC. This is usually benign, like a normal variant but it could also represent benign causes like edema or trauma or mastitis. Notable exceptions when this is neoplastic are inflammatory breast cancer or breast lymphoma cases, okay? But these are relatively uncommon and when they do happen, you know clinically. I mean, the inflammatory breast cancer and the lymphoma patients, likely it will be an, a, a large and large breast. It'll be uncomfortable, maybe even be painful with inflammatory breasts and gorge. So, is not going to be a diagnostic dilemma. And chances are, when you see something like this, it is a normal variant, but do think about the history if there's possibilities of edema, trauma, or mastitis, giving you this global asymmetry shown here in the left breast. That's usually a bi rats too benign finding. Now, focal asymmetry is kind of in the middle. It could be benign, nothing, or it could be a cancer. And this is a, a classic bi rats three, probably benign finding. And in the early days, in the 1990s, when the category of BIRAS3 probably benign was um, popularized, the focal asymmetry was one of the classic findings within this category. The PPV of this lesion in the large series are less than 2%. And remember, 2% is that threshold that we accept as the malignancy rate, the upper limit for BIRAS3 probably benign lesions. And in these series, it was less than 1% even, it was 0.7% on average. So a focal asymmetry is seen in two or more projections. The margins could be concave and you can have fat interspersed. And that's how it is different from a mass, where a mass should be convex and a mass should be densest at the center without uh, loosened fat. So let me show you an example of a focal asymmetry on this MLO and CC. And what you have here in the retroareolar and lateral breast is your focal asymmetry. It's two projections, but not quite a mass. You can see fat interspersed and the margins are concave and not convex. Okay, now review. Asymmetry, which as I said, is a one view finding, focal asymmetry, and then the mass, okay? Um, one big difference between these lesions is that, I already said it, asymmetry, one view, focal asymmetry masses, two views or more. Asymmetry, you usually see as screening versus focal asymmetry of mass, you can see as screening or diagnostic. And the reason is because when you do recall asymmetry from screening and you work them up diagnostically, uh, you, they usually dis are dismissed because they represent summation artifact superimposition of fibroglandular structures or 
they get upgraded to a mass or a focal asymmetry because you're now seeing it with three-dimensionality in the second view. Now, asymmetry and focal asymmetry, the margins can be concave, but in the mass, uh, by definition, the margins are convex outward. And that's an important distinction. And then the last distinctions which categorizes the asymmetries are that they can be interspersed with fat and therefore look darker or loosened in the middle versus a true mass should be densest at the center, whitest at the center at mammography. So these are some of the comparisons, similarities and differences between asymmetry, focal asymmetry and mass. Now, we talked about these being the four categories or four lesion types within the category of asymmetries. There is the fourth one, which is the developing asymmetry. And this is a brand new term because it wasn't present in 2003 or 1998, the fourth or the third edition. And a developing asymmetry is basically a focal asymmetry that has increased since the prior exam. Increased because it has either appeared new or increased in size and or conspicuity. Okay? You, see it, you see it more because it's bigger, it's denser for some reason, or just wasn't there and now it's brand new. That's a developing asymmetry. Interval change increases the likelihood of malignancy. If you don't have contributory histories, such as surgery, trauma, or infection. Okay? So whenever you have something new, we kind of worry. Bigger, we worry more in breast imaging. I kind of make a little joke that uh, bigger is always better in terms of diamonds, diamond rings, diamond necklaces, but bigger is not better in terms of breast imaging, uh, breast lesions, and we don't want bigger lesions because that interval change increases the likelihood of being cancer. Uh, again, this is a new term that was incorporated, codified in the fifth edition of BIRADS. And this term came from some of the results that we had uh, a while ago in March, 2007, that we published from San Francisco. And in the sake of time, I'm just gonna bring you to the findings themselves in just a little bit, okay? But let me show you an example of a developing asymmetry first. Prior mammogram on the left-hand side, current mammogram on the right-hand side. And there is a developing asymmetry and that is the cancer. And where is it? It is here. Okay. That finding wasn't present on the prior MLO mammogram. How about the CC? It is there in the inner breast. So that is a developing asymmetry. I'm showing that to you in both the MLO and the CC, not present on the prior mammogram. Therefore, it is a, a developing asymmetry. And let me show you the correlate of this in the MLO compared with the sagittal MRI. Biopsy has taken place now because there is this, which is a signal void from the biopsy clip, the artifact. So this is linear non-mass enhancement correlating very nicely with this developing symmetry that's also linear. And the histology, this was a biopsy under stereotaxis, uh, was an invasive ductal carcinoma. And just to complete, you know, just for fun, I wanna show you the 3D printed image of this cancer was shown here in the yellow. And this is uh, some of the work. And I uh, want to acknowledge my colleagues here at MD Anderson Cancer Center in using the 3D modeling techniques to hopefully help our patients understand what's going on as well as to guide our surgeons in surgical excision. So this is a 3D printed model of that cancer. Uh, and here we have MLO, mammogram, sagittal MRI and then the 3D printing, showing you a nice correlation from modality to modality. Okay. So that is the developing asymmetry. Going back to the study that codified the term or that first uh, introduced the term, made popular the term developing asymmetry, we looked at a lot of screening mammograms, a lot of diagnostic mammograms, and we found that these lesions, the developing asymmetry are not that common. These are the number of exams we looked at in the screening and the diagnostic cohort. And we saw that um, they occurred less than 1% of the time. But as you know, if you read a lot of mammograms, even if they're not common, you're gonna find them, right? And I would imagine, for example, in the screening program that you have in uh, Egypt, that you do a lot of mammograms and you're gonna find them, you're gonna come across them. So it's important to know how we deal with them based on a evidence-based way. And the evidence-based way shows this. The PPV, after you work out the lesions in either the screening cohort or the diagnostic cohort, are these numbers, 13% and 27%. 
Remember, 2% is the upper limit of buy red three, probably benign, right? So while these numbers are not super high, they're not 50%, they're not 80%, they're definitely greater than 2% and high enough that you should biopsy them. And that's the lesson. And another lesson is that you should perform the biopsy even if there is no correlate seen at ultrasound. Now, remember that TOMO is a theme here. How does TOMO affect the evaluation of the mammographic asymmetries? And to summarize, I would say, no change in BIRAD's terminology currently. There's no unique terms for TOMO. The asymmetries are the same four categories as, as I just showed you for the 2D. I think for developing asymmetry, TOMO is not gonna help that much or change that much. And it is because with the developing asymmetry, the key is not so much the margin or the shape, of course, of course they're important. But the most important thing is the interval change, the temporal change. And that uh, temporal change is not really affected whether it's TOMO or 2D, okay? But the thing that really, really, really helps with TOMO as compared to 2D is your focal asymmetry or your one view asymmetry versus a true mass. Now that TOMO has really made an impact because TOMO it, with the thin slices can help make the distinction between a focal asymmetry or one, one view asymmetry versus a true mass. Uh, and going back now, remember this is the 1998 article I referred you to, that was a classic one. And 20 years later in 2018, uh, uh, my colleagues and myself from MD Anderson did a very, very similar study. But of course, 20 years have passed. We have digital mammogram instead of screen film. And importantly, we now have TOMO. So we're looking at how did TOMO affect the one view asymmetries. And I just want to share this with you kind of for fun. This is a web link that I can, um, uh, that you're welcome to access uh, and that this was done in celebration of October, 2020, the Breast Cancer Awareness Month by the American Rankin Race Society. And here's the webpage. And I bring that up because on that page, there's a podcast that we did that was about 10 minutes long, about 15 minutes long. That was kind of a, a chat, if you will, by the uh, fireplace um, between myself, the first author of the article 20 years later, and Dr. Sickles, who wrote the article in 1998 on asymmetry. So I would encourage you to, if you have some time, to go and listen to that. So going back to the article in 2018 from MD Anderson and what our findings were. We looked at a lot of, you know, a lot of findings and a lot in a, in a situation means the following numbers, asymmetries over 1,000, 1,554 exact, uh, less with TOMO, but we did find some statistically significant numbers, okay? So primarily one of your findings was asymmetries versus calcifications or distortions. So these are really the summary point, if you will. When we add TOMO, which is the middle column here versus uh, 2D digital mammogram, we find that the need to recall from screening is decreased. 1.4 versus 3.1% of the time, statistically significant. We find that our PPV1, that is number of cancers per recall rate has increased from 1.8 to four. So this is statistically significant as well. So this goes along with the decreased recall, increased cancer detection, if you will, okay? Uh, PPV3, we also found to have increased and this is the number of cancers per biopsy performed, but this finding was not statistically significant. So less frequently recalled, and a higher PPV1, that those findings were statistically significant with the addition of tomosynthesis. Let me show you a case from our practice. MLO on the left, CC on your right. These are 2D mammograms. I read this case and I'm like, hmm, do I see anything abnormal? I think these are nice mammograms, right? Good positioning, inclusion of the pectoralis muscle. You can even see some pectoralis muscle here on the CC view. What maybe scatter fibroglandular density, what caught my attention was really here in the upper breast. And I try to look for this, you know, this is a one view finding if you will. And I really didn't see much here on the uh, outer breast here. And so the, is this a one view finding? Should I recall it? You know, what's going on? Should I be worried? I'm kind of worried because it looks a little bit irregular and maybe even a little speculated. But of course, at the same time, I want to make sure I don't have a lot of false positives. I don't want to recall unless I, you know, think there's a chance of it being a cancer, right? Is this a potential cancer? Should it be recalled? And I'm like, oh, 
I have Tomo. Let me look at the Tomo. So let's look at the Tomo here in the MLO upper aspect. And here's the Tomo. Focusing here, right there, what do you think? Do you wanna recall this? Or is this just superimposition of fibroglandular structures? Mm, I was 50-50, I wasn't sure. Let me show them to you bigger, this is enlarged, okay? So what you have is this region. Is that real or is that just tissue as you go across the planes? I'm not sure. Maybe real, maybe not. So this is somewhat earlier days when we had tomosynthesis and I wasn't sure. Now, maybe now, several years later, I would be more confident to say BIRATS1 negative, but that moment I wasn't. Uh, but this is how I would use Tomo to help me. So this situation, since I wasn't sure I did recall, so I have data to show you. This is the MLO that initially troubled me, but when she came back from recall, here it is, 90 degree lateral, and I don't see that anymore. And then here are the spike compression views of the upper posterior breast in both the MLO projection and the 90 degree lateral projection. And I don't see that anymore. And uh, conclusion is that negative, no lesion seen. And this is the panoramic ultrasound of the entire superior breast on that side, the right side. And I still don't see any lesions. So I can feel confident now that that's summation artifact. And the idea is that when you, in most cases, when you get more confident, you hopefully can use Tomo to reach that conclusion without the need for additional images. Okay. So uh, going back uh, as a review of the data with the addition of Tomo, excuse me, one view asymmetry says screening, recall less frequently, less commonly represents summation artifacts when recall and worked up higher PPB, that is more likely to be cancer when recall and worked up. So these are the um, repeat of the lessons that we learned. And this is kind of what we expected from knowing about the background of tomosynthesis and what it does in most, in the data that's available now, which is primarily in screening. Now, how about architecture distortion? And for a summary point, I'm gonna tell you that for Tomo, architecture distortion had the opposite effect as asymmetries. Now, what is architecture distortion? It is distortion of tissues, white lines emanating from the center, and uh, it can be seen as the desmoplastic or scarring reaction that's caused by some tumors upon the adjacent tissues. It is different from a speculated mass because the central density is not really present. It is really the lines and the distortion that you see. Of course, you can have benign etiologies, right? Like a post-surgical scar or radio scar. So it is important to know the history of surgery because prior surgery causing distortion is very common. And when you know that and you can correlate it, then of course you can say by rats to benign without worrying and without workup. So this case was a case of a, case of a patient who uh, had surgical history, but compared with prior was thought to have increased, which is there in the 90 degree lateral MLO and CC and show them to you bigger photographically enlarged. Uh, and I want to show you this case because of the MR, okay? So before MR, after, excuse me, before contrast and after contrast. And what we have here on MR is distortion. You see how they're kind of lines emanating from the center? The challenge or the take-home lesson here is that on the bottom where you do have contrast, you don't have enhancement of this area. You have the heart here, which has contrast but you don't have enhancement of the, of, the, of the scar. So suggesting to us that this is a scar only and no problem. Now, we did a very similar study with distortions as we, do, as we did for the developing asymmetry studies I showed you earlier. And uh, I'll just briefly show you some of the key findings from that study. And from that study, when we looked at how often distortions occur at screening or at diagnostic mammography, we find that they don't occur very often, again, less than 1% of the time. So not frequent. And just to keep in mind that these are the correlating numbers for asymmetry. So uh, the for developing asymmetry, that is. So in other words, distortions are not common, less than 1%, but they are more common than developing asymmetries. But again, even if they're not common, it is important that we recognize them because they could be a cancer, right? And we don't want too high a false positive either. So let's look at how often they are cancers, the probability of malignancy. And when we do that, we found that for the screening arm, it was 
For the diagnostic arm, it was 55%. Remember, these are the correlated numbers, PPVs, for uh, the developing asymmetry. So for developing asymmetry and for architecture distortion, the PPV is greater than 2%, which means that we need to biopsy them. They are at least by rats 4 and some cases, uh, they are at least by rats, they're by rats 4 type of lesions, by rats 4 suspicious because of these percentages, 13, 27 for developing asymmetry, for screening and diagnostic cohorts, and 15 and 55 for uh, the distortion cohorts, okay? Um, and that means that you should biopsy them. And another lesson is that for distortions, they're more likely to be cancers than for developing asymmetries. And if you see them in the diagnostic setting, it's more likely to be cancers than if you see them at the screening setting. And this point, which was made with developing asymmetry is made again with distortions. You need to perform the biopsy even if there is no correlate at ultrasound. Here is uh, another example, a 2D mammogram. This is distortion, posterior breast a little bit lower, and here it is inner breast right there. Um, this is kind of subtle. I don't definitely see a mass, but when I went to do ultrasound on this area, we did see a mass, right? And this is a, a suspicious lesion, biopsy this, this was a cancer, okay? So that's distortion as a cancer, use ultrasound. Of course, when you have something on ultrasound, biopsy under ultrasound. The lesson here is that when you don't have anything on the ultrasound, you, you should still biopsy it. Okay, so that's a brief background on distortion. How does TOMO affect things? Well, TOMO affect things because we see more of them now because of the uh, fact that we see clearer and we see distortion so well. So what I have for you is 2D on your left, synthetic on your middle, in the middle, and then a single slice DBT on your right-hand side. Can you see the very, very subtle distortion? Okay, these here, the lines emanating from the center here. I can kind of see it maybe, but it's really the, on the 2D, but it's really the uh, Tomo slice I see it best. And I'm kind of stuck now, right? I'm like, you know, should I recall this? What should I do? This is the current screen. Well, uh, lucky for me is that I had a prior, this is subtle architecture distortion, would you biopsy this finding? What would you do, okay? Would you recall, would you biopsy? Well. On the prior screen, I happen to have one that shows a scar marker. You see this, this line here? That's the scar marker, okay? And it correlates to the area of the distortion. So that tells me confidently that that is a post-surgical scar. So I concluded that it's a post-surgical scar by rats too benign, and therefore do not need to recall, do not need to biopsy. So it's just to show you how uh, we use all the information, including the scar marker, which I did not have on the current year, but the prior year I did, and that uh, helps me to not need to do anything further about this subtle distortion. Okay, so that's a real life example. Now, this is data from Boston in November, 2017, looking at distortions between 2D and TOMO. The study is very analogous to the study that MD Anderson did on the asymmetries between 2D and 2D with TOMO. Looking at frequency, this looks at positive predictive value and then looked at the frequency of radio scar. And it found that with when you add TOMO, you see and recall distortions much more, right? Went from 0.07% to 0.14%. The chance of cancer is lower. Went from 74% in, the, in their study to 51%, but you find many more radio scars. And maybe that's why you have more distortion, but less cancers because you have more radio scars from 12% with 2D to 33% when you add a TOMO. So the lesson's exactly opposite from asymmetries. With addition of TOMO, distortion at screening is recalled more frequently, has a lower PV, PPV, less likely to be cancer when recall and worked up, and you find more radio scars. Okay, so it's kind of easy to remember in some ways because these findings are kind of the opposite of what we found with uh, the addition of TOMO for asymmetries. Um, they also reported this Boston study that when you have an ultrasound correlate, you're more likely to be cancer, 67%. But even when you don't have a correlate, you are still possible to be a cancer. And in their setting was a, a, a good 30%, okay? So again, this means that even if you don't see anything on ultrasound, 
you should do a biopsy. And usually for us, that means serotaxis or tomosynthesis guided biopsy. So I'm going to conclude with this last case. Here is the DBT. Do you see the distortion? This is extremely dense breast. Very subtle, but there in the upper. And there it is. Everybody see the distortion here? And then centrally on the inner. Okay? On the CC, excuse me. You see that distortion. So that's distortion and that's distortion. And uh, when you compare the 2D synthetic on either side, you can see that the findings are you know, not that evident, right? It's, it's here and it's here centrally, but really kind of subtle is really the DBT that showed you. Now, when we did spot compression views, I show you the arrow, you can kind of see some distortion on the 2D spot, but again, it is that uh, DBT slice that shows it best. And that's the change with Tomo error of, of distortions. No correlate seen at ultrasound. Would you biopsy this? And the answer is yes, right? I showed you the data that show that if this is, uh, you don't know what it is, you don't know this is a scar, even there's no correlate ultrasound, you should biopsy it. And the Boston data supports that because the number here is 30%, which is higher, of course, than 2%. And uh, just to remind us how beautifully this is shown at Tomo, and this is the distortion distortion, and this is photographically enlarged for you. What we did was we did a stereotaxis slash tomosynthesis guided biopsy. And here you have the clip in the place. So MLO, a lateral MLO, you see that? Corresponding to the distortion, distortion, and now you have the clip. Diagnosis in this case was radio scar. Okay. All right, so lastly, uh, this is recent in September, uh, early publication online only of a meta-analysis. That means they looked at a lot of data instead of only one institution or one data to look at malignant outcomes of distortion on TOMO. And this was a meta-analysis of 13 retrospective observational studies comprising of 857 distortions seen on TOMO. Conclusion was PPV was 35% overall, definitely higher than 2%, definitely biopsy, and that 78% um, of those that were cancer had an ultrasound correlate. So that means definitely do ultrasound as a first workup tool. Clinical impact, a needle biopsy should be performed for architecture distortion on TOMA without a known etiology. That is, unless you know, for example, that it is a surgical scar. Since most malignant distortions have an ultrasound finding, an ultrasound exam should be performed to look for a correlate, but the, coral, but the absence of a correlate does not obviate the need for a biopsy. I know I went over time. I was uh, taking advantage of this privilege to speak with all of you on the webinar today. I wanted to present my data and to show you well, what- Well, thank you, Professor Long. It's a well, very demonstrative presentation. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you very much. Um, and now we'll proceed for the second session uh, by Professor Dr. Rasha Kamel. Uh, professor Dr. Rasha Kamel, she is uh, the professor of radiology at Al-Swalani Hospital, Cairo University. She actually is the head of the Women's Imaging Unit. She is the president of the Egyptian Society of Breast Imaging, uh, and she is the chief consultant at Beharia Breast Cancer uh, for treatment and screening of the breast cancer. She was the first one to uh, directs the residential campaign for breast screening for the Egyptian women, and she's actually a pioneer in breast imaging uh, participation and teaching uh, in Egypt for almost now for 30 years. A uh, presentation of Professor Dr. Rasha Kamal will be about the Bahia's experience for functional imaging of breast. Yes, uh, thank you, Sahar, for the introduction, and thank you, Jessica, for this informative lecture. Uh, my uh, presentation today will be about the functional imaging of the breast. I'm going to give you my uh, Bahia's experience in functional imaging. Uh, in the past few years, the volume of breast imaging modalities have actually grown exponentially, and thus implementing sound practice has become a real uh, challenge. And uh, whichever imaging, breast imaging modality we are using, we say we have a benign lesion when we have rounded or oval lesions, which are circumscribed, iso or, hypo, in the, or hypodense. And when we inject contrast, they show homogeneous enhancement or dark septations. And we say we have malignant lesions when we have lesions which appear irregular in shape, non-circumscribed, hyperdense. Uh, and when we inject contrast, they show heterogeneous or rim enhancement. If things were uh, uh, white and black as they appear to be, then only one modality would suffice in the differentiation between benign and malignant lesions. 
But unfortunately, we have an, a, a large number of lesions which combine both benign and malignant uh, descriptors. And these lesions fall in the gray zone or the indeterminate breast lesions. And when adding new technologies to breast imaging, we are mainly aiming to decrease the, to increase the white and the dark zone on the expense of the gray or the indeterminate uh, zone. And in an attempt to reduce the number of lesions that fall in the gray zone or the indeterminate lesions, some, le some modalities depend on an enhanced morphology assessment like the mammography, the tomosynthesis, and the ultrasound. Other modalities uh, depend on giving us some functional information to be able to differentiate between benign and malignant lesions like the diffusion-weighted imaging, the spectroscopy, and the PET mammography. And we have other modalities which combine, combine both enhanced morphology assessment and functional information like the MRI and the contrast mammography. And in this lecture today, we are ma mainly concerned with the modalities which provide functional information. And having a closer look at these modalities, we will find that some of these modalities provide this functional information through the injection of contrast media, like the contrast mammography and MRI. Others depend on giving us information about the lesion cellularity, like the diffusion weighted image, and others provide us with information as regards the metabolism of the cells, like the spectroscopy and the PEM. And we'll start by discussing the, the uh, modalities which use contrast media. And both contrast and MRI, a contrast mammography and MRI depend on the on the on the, on the, the principle of angiogenesis. And actually, during the past few years, many methods for imaging angiogenesis in vivo have been developed by the injection of intra intravenous contrast agents. The tumor cells, as they grow, they secrete a pro-angiogenic factors that stimulate the proliferation of new blood vessels and new capillaries. But unfortunately, these new capillaries are not well formed so they allow the leakage of contrast uh, within the surrounding tissues. Uh, actually, both contrast and MRI use angiogenesis in the assessment of breast uh, lesions. And actually, both modalities have features in common. In both modalities, we inject contrast media in order to highlight lesions within the breast. In MRI, we use a pair of pre-contrast images and the post-contrast images, and the net result is a subtracted image uh, in which the area of concern is highlighted by the contrast uptake. In contrast mammography, it's not the same because the two images are taken in the post-contrast sequences. We take a low energy sequence, which is exactly gives us an image which is exactly like the mammogram and the high energy image, which is very sensitive to iodine and the subtraction of both gives us the recombined image in which the area of contrast again, of concern again is enhanced by the uptake of the contrast. And like they have similarities, they also have different features. If we compare both, we will find that contrast mammography is less time consuming, better tolerated with a relatively lower cost. It is easier to interpret. And uh, one major advantage of contrast mammography it is that we can still assess microcalcifications. Uh, and this is, feature is not present at all in MRI. But we also have to admit that MRI is still the top notch modality for assessing or characterizing breast lesions because of the multi-sequential and multi-planar imaging capabilities which allows better lesion detection and characterization. And in spite of being the top modality in breast imaging, when we think of add-on exams in Bahia Hospital, we usually think of contrast mammography first before MRI. And to understand this, we must have a look on the workflow in Bahia Hospital. In Bahia, we have uh, two, about 250 to 300 cases referred to the radiology department each day. Uh, weekly, we have four MDTs. In each MDT, we see approximately 50 cases. And look, looking at this high flow, we can simply say that in Bahia, really every minute counts. And in spite of this high flow of uh, patients in uh, Bahia, we are still mainly concerned with providing flawless screening and diagnostic services to our patients, because we strongly believe that patient convenience is the only way to reach a high compliance rate. 
and uh, we can never do so unless we decrease the number of steps and days that the patient takes from the time she is diagnosed to the time she is managed. And that's why we usually adjust our schedules in such a way to allow for add-on exams to the routine mammography and ultrasound examination in order to reach an accurate diagnosis in the shortest period of time. And when we think of these add-on exams, that's why we choose contrast mammography because of its previously mentioned advantages. And sometimes we also add a biopsy to the contrast mammography on the same day. And we only resort to MRI in some selected cases. And to know these selected cases, we're going to answer together four questions uh, regarding the use of contrast mammography and MRI concerning screening, screening lesion characterization, staging, and follow-up. And we'll start by having a look at screening, when to use contrast mammography and when, or MRI. Uh, in general, the female population can be classified into an average risk population who have no specific risk of developing breast cancer, a moderate risk population which have an incidence of more than 50, of about 15 to 20% higher than the general population, and the high risk population which have an incidence of 20 to 25% more than the uh, general population. Uh, for the average risk and the moderate risk individuals, uh, we usually mammography plus or minus ultrasound are recommended starting the age of 40. While for the high risk and the and selected moderate risk individuals, we usually do mammography uh, plus or minus an ultrasound with an MRI starting at an earlier age of 35 years. And it is here where contrast mammography can really compete with MRI uh, because why do two modalities when we get the same when we can get the same information using one modality. And recently, a research article was published in the radiology discussing the performance of dual energy contrast enhanced digital mammography for screening women at an, at an increased risk of breast cancer. Uh, this is one example of a 48-year-old uh, female. She was classified as a moderate-risk individual based on the heterogeneous dense breast parenchyma. Her mammogram showed no lesions, when we, when, while the contrast mammography showed subtle contrast uptake in the inf left inframammary uh, fold. A targeted ultrasound examination was performed and an underlying speculated mass lesion was, uh, was seen and a biopsy was taken and this was an invasive lobular carcinoma. Uh, this is another case, again, she was, she was a moderate risk individual. She had newly developed microcalcifications in the left uh, breast. Uh, contrast mammography was performed and showed no, showed no corresponding uh, contrast enhancement, while on the MRI we, showed, uh, we saw a focal numb mass enhancement, a picture which was suggestive of an underlying DCIS. On plotting the time signal intensity curve, it was a type 1 benign curve, biopsy was taken and revealed an atypical ductal hyperplasia. Although this is considered a false positive result on MRI, but if we think it, think it logically, this is not a false positive, uh, a true false positive result because actually atypical ductal hyperplasia should be removed because they are the last step before developing a ductal carcinoma in situ. Now moving to question two, and that is lesion characterization, when to perform contrast mammography and when to perform MRI. And up, to, uh, up till now, we do not have a lexicon for contrast mammography, and that's why we use the MRI uh, lexicon to describe lesions on MRI, where lesions can be classified as enhancing focus, enhancing mass, and enhancing numb mass. Uh, to see how we use the MRI descriptors in describing lesions, the same lesions in MRI and uh, uh, contrast mammography, we can have a look at this case, where if we look at the lesion in the right breast, it is described as being a mass lesion, it is oval in shape, has circumscribed margins with dark internal septations, all features uh, pointing to a benign diagnosis, and actually this was a fibroadenoma. While the lesion on the left breast, it is described as a numb mass, it is asymmetrical, region, taking a regional distribution with a clump pattern, all features pointing to a malignant pathology, and this was actually a malignant invasive duct carcinoma. When we look at the MRI of the same patient, we can use the same descriptors to describe both the lesions in the right breast and the lesion in the left uh, breast. 
And exactly like MRI, when lesions do not show contrast uptake, they have a, a very high potential to be benign uh, lesions. This is a 70-year-old female with a newly developed palpable left breast mass lesion. She had this segmental mass lesion with indeterminate microcalcifications, which became even more apparent and more suspicious on the TOMOS synthesis. While with a single look on the contrast mammography, this lesion did not show any contrast uptake, a biopsy was taken, and this was mainly uh, uh, simply uh, sequelae of periductal mastitis. Uh, but still we have some lesions in which MRI is still much superior than contrast mammography, and one of these lesions is the inflammatory breast disorders. When we have patients presenting with inflammatory breast signs, contrast mammography is not the correct choice at all for these patients. And this case is an example to show you this. This patient presented with the left breast inflammatory uh, changes, and she had this focal asymmetry in the left breast. This was her contrast mammogram, under, uh, mammogram underlying the uh, asymmetry. There was a mass lesion. It was oval in shape with rim enhancement, and it showed associated anterior intraductal extension, all features pointing to an underlying malignant pathology. While with a simple look on the MRI, yes, the lesion showed uh, rim enhancement, but on the T2-weighted image, it showed an internal bright to fluid signal, and this was simply an abscess cavity in a case of granulomatous mastitis. Uh, MRI is also uh, much superior than count contrast mammography whenever we have lesions in hidden mammography areas like the inframammary fold, the upper inner breast quadrant, and the axilla, deeply seated lesions within the axilla. Uh, this patient, she presented with a palpable right breast mass. She had a heterogeneous dense parenchyma, and this was her contrast mammogram, which showed no contrast uptake at all. A targeted ultrasound examination to the area of concern showed an underlying speculated hypoechoic mass lesion, and this was her MRI. The lesion was here all the time, but it was missed on the mammogram because it was deeply seated lesion in the inframammary fold, and it was out of the mammographic uh, view. So if we uh, want to summarize the in, in uh, lesion characterization, MRI is considered superior to contrast mammography whenever we have lesions situated in hidden mammography areas and whenever we have patients presenting with inflammatory breast disorders. Now moving to the third question, which is staging, which to use contrast mammography or MRI. And when speaking of staging, we are mainly speaking about local regional staging, like the, which means that we are assessing the size of the lesion, the multiplicity of the lesions, the lymph node status, and the attachment to the skin, the nipple, and the test wall. Uh, although, uh, we performed a study in Bahia co com comparing the sizes of the lesions on the mammography, the conscious mammography, and MRI, and actual good, cor high co good correlation was seen uh, with conscious mammography and MRI, but still MRI showed higher uh, results. And the difference between contrast mammography and MRI was mainly because of this underestimation of speculated mass lesions and introductal components with the contrast uh, mammography. And this case is a good example to show you this. This is a mass seen in the contrast mammography. If we compare the size on the contrast mammography, the size on the mammogram, and the size on the tomosynthesis, definitely a wider extension is appreciated on the tomosynthesis, and it was underestimated on the contrast mammography. We also have some pathologies in which uh, um, MRI takes the upper hand as a preoperative staging uh, modality. Uh, one of these uh, 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 one of these cases is the Paget's disease of the nipple. Uh, this female patient, she had a heterogeneous dense breast, and she was diagnosed as having Paget's disease of the left nipple. This was uh, this was a, 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 a had a scattered microcalcifications in the left breast, and this was her mammogram, which showed no contrast uptake. Although going back after performing the MRI, we said maybe this was a, the subtle enhancement, that, but it was not apparent as it appeared on the MRI. An MRI was performed for this patient and see the difference, her nipple was enhancing and there was posterior uh, segmental non-mass enhancement reaching down to the pectoral uh, 
muscle uh, a biopsy was taken. And this was a case of DCIS associating Paget's disease of the nipple. So to add to our list in staging, uh, MRI is still superior whenever we have, uh, we uh, want to assess the size of speculated lesions. Whenever we have Paget's disease of the nipple or a low grade DCIS, whenever we have to want to assess the associated intraductal extension or chest wall invasion. And now, um, now moving to the follow-up, and when speaking about follow-up, we are speaking about follow-up uh, in the post-operative or the post-breast cancer surveillance, or the follow-up of patients receiving new adjuvant therapy. And for the post-breast cancer surveillance, we have the patient either falls in one of three scenarios. In scenario one, the patient has opera it was operated upon and an operative pathology report comes back with a positive margin. And in these cases, MRI is far superior, more than contrast mammography with the same principles that we said concerning the inflammatory breast lesions. The second scenario is surveillance of an asymptomatic patient. And in the asymptomatic patient, neither the MRI nor the contrast mammography are indicated. It's just a mammogram and an ultrasound, and we should not proceed to further imaging unless, unless the patient moves to the third scenario, which is surveillance of a symptomatic survivor. And in these cases, MRI and contrast mammography can be used equally with the previously mentioned uh, uh, drawbacks of contrast mammography. Uh, this is a moderate risk 34 year old female with past history of left mastectomy. Uh, on her screening mammogram, we, we uh, noticed that there are newly developed microcalcifications seen at six o'clock location of the right breast. Uh, this was her contrast mammography, which showed segmental numb mass enhancement corresponding to the microcalcifications, and the same picture was also seen on MRI. But when it comes to mastectomy bed, contrast mammography has no role in assessing the mastectomy bed, and it is only the role of ultrasound or MRI to identify operative bed, uh, mastectomy bed uh, recurrent lesions. And so to add, and this uh, for the follow-up of the cases, well, of the new adjuvant cases, many uh, research work was published uh, uh, stating that contrast mammography is as efficient as MRI in following up patients receiving new adjuvant chemotherapy. This was a female 38-year-old female patient with a triple negative invasive duct carcinoma. Uh, she received, uh, this was her pre-chemotherapy films, and this was her post new adjuvant therapy films. It's difficult to say on the mammogram whether there is a response or a complete response or partial response. But when we look on the, on the contrast mammogram and we see no enhancement at all, then this is complete radiological response. And so we'll add to the list of the MRI superiority list that in assessing a residual disease in the immediate post-operative uh, period, still MRI takes the upper hand and in the assessment of mastectomy bed uh, recurrence. And now we'll move to the second group of, of uh, imaging techniques and that, that is the lesions which provide information about the lesion cellularity. Uh, diffusion weighted imaging provides a high sensitivity in the detection of changes in the local biological environment of tumors. A significant advantage of uh, diffusion weighted MRI over conventional MRI is its high sensitivity without the injection of contrast media. Usually the water molecules move in a free random motion called the Brownian uh, motion. The degree of restriction to water diffusion in biological tissue is dependent on the tissue cellularity and the integrity of the cell membranes. Where if we see this figure showing a, a tissue with increased cellularity, we will find that the water molecule uh, diffusion is restricted. While if we have uh, lesions of low cellularity or with damaged cell membranes, we will see that the lesion uh, that the water molecule uh, uh, move freely. And in assessing diffusion weighted imaging, we do either a qualitative assessment or a quantitative assessment. In the qualitative assessment, we just look at the lesions, we see how they behave on the B0, the B8, and the ADC. If we have lesions which are dark, then they become bright and then they return dark. These are said to have restricted diffusion and these are usually include the malignant lesions and some benign lesions. If we have other lesions which appear bright, 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 
or dark, dark and dark, then we say they have facilitated diffusion and these usually uh, include the benign lesions and the cyst. And because of the overlap of benign lesions between the restricted and the facilitated lesions, we usually measure the ADC values of the of, uh, lesions and the lesions be below 1.1 are usually considered malignant. Uh, this is one example from, uh, from my colleague, Dr. Sahar Mansour. We have uh, two different cases, one with a lesion in the left breast and the other with the right breast. They are both rounded and bright on the stir. And when we injected the contrast, they show more or less a similar pattern of contrast uptake. If you look at the first lesion on the B850 diffusion weighted image, it is not bright. Then this is, is a restricted, is an, a facilitated diffusion. And the other lesion, it showed a bright signal, which means that it is a restricted diffusion uh, in comparison to the diff ADC uh, map. The first lesion was actually a fibroadenoma, and the second lesion was an invasive ductal carcinoma. Uh, this is another case. This is a rounded, circumscribed, hyperdense uh, mass, and this was her contrast mammogram. And we had concern on the contrast mammography, whether this is heterogeneous enhancement or dark internal septations. Uh, this was her MRI examination, which showed an intermediate T2 signal, a bright stir signal with heterogeneous contrast uptake and a plateau, uh, high peak plateau curve. This was her diffusion weighted image. As we go from the B0 to the B850, we find that the brightness of the lesion, the lesion fades. And this was how it appeared on the ADC. It was bright on the ADC. So this means it is facilitated diffusion and a biopsy was taken from this lesion and revealed a fibroadenoma. Uh, now we move to the third uh, group of, um, uh, of imaging modalities, and that is the lesion, uh, the modalities which give us some uh, information about the metabolic activities of cells. And we'll start by discussing the spectroscopy. Uh, MRS can provide tumor metabolic more, uh, information. Uh, studies of experimental breast tumors have shown that the choline is elevated in malignant lesions. The peak choline resonance at or higher than 3.2 are markers of active metabolic lesions examples at cancerous cells. Uh, this information can be used for several clinical applications like mon monitoring the response to neoadjuvant therapy or improving the accuracy of lesion characterization. Uh, this is an, a case uh, which shows, uh, which is rounded, circumscribed uh, on the subtraction image. It shows homogeneous contrast uptake, and it shows an intermediate to bright E2 signal. When doing the MR spectroscopy, there was an associated high choline peak, and actually this uh, biopsy revealed a triple negative breast cancer, and actually this is the typical appearance of triple negative breast cancers, which are usually missed uh, on an ultrasound examination in young individuals as fibro Enormous. Uh, this is another case. She had a tiny lesion in the right breast, which showed contrast uptake, a homogeneous enhancement, and we all know that tiny lesions are difficult to get to be characterized. On the stir, they appeared bright with a dark T1 and an intermediate T2 signal. On the, on the diffusion weighted image, as we moved from the B0 to the P, uh, B50 to the B850, there was fading of the lesion and uh, the ADC value was 1.2. This was her spectroscopy, which showed a low choline peak of 0.2 and a biopsy was taken from this lesion and it was a fibroadenoma. And last but not least, we are going to speak about the PET mammography. Uh, the PET mammography is a specialized application of PET to visualize breast tissue metabolic changes with a much higher spatial resolution, thus allowing the visualization of small tumor cells. Uh, the most used positron emitting radionuclide for imaging cancer in PET and PEM is the 18F fluorodeoxyglucose. The FDG uh, is used to detect glucose consumption, which is known to be increased in cancerous cells compared to normal cells. As tumor cells proliferate and grow, specific metabolic pathways are activated to provide them with oxygen, glucose, and other nutrients, which are essential for the growth of cancer cells. And one of these pathways is the anaerobic metabolism. We'll have a look on the cancer cells and how the glucose and the FDG uh, behave within the cells. If you look at 
it is uptaken by the cells by the glucose transfer enzymes which are activated by the malignant cells and inside the uh, inside the cell the glucose is subjected to the hexokinase enzyme which turns glucose into glucose 6 phosphate and then this glucose 6 phosphate becomes metabolized by the anaerobic glycolysis uh, things are not different with the FDG. The FDG is also uptaken by the cells by the glucose transfer enzymes. Inside the cells, it is also subjected to the hexokinase enzyme, which changes it into FDG phosphate. But what's different is that the FDG phosphate is not metabolized inside the cell by the anaerobic glycolysis. And that's why it gets entrapped within the cells. And because of this entrapment, it gives us adequate time to image the radio tracer uh, when doing the PET mama. Uh, in Bahia, we use the Naviscam Pemflex Solo 2 uh, machine. Uh, the, we test for the glucose level, and the patient is asked to, uh, to fast for four to six hours. Uh, and then we inject the radio tracer and we wait for 16 to 90 minutes before we take the different uh, views in the CC, MLO, and the extended auxiliary views. The scanning time is 10 minutes for each breast, with a total time of 40 minutes. Uh, the patients are imaged in the upright position, although in some other machines, the patient is imaged in the prone position, and the breast is gently stabilized between clear compression paddles. And within these compression paddles, we have two opposing PET detectors with that move in a linear manner with the compression paddles to scan the breast for approximately 10 minutes. We view the breast in the CZ view, the medial-lateral oblique view and the ex extended axillary view, but in a way similar to the tomosynthesis and not uh, like the mammography. That means we take tomographic images in each view. Uh, the PEM images are actually displayed as a 12 slice tomographic slices, and the slice thickness is equal to the compressed breast thickness divided by 12. We either view these images in the grayscale or in the color-coded scale, which enhances the difference between the enhancing lesion and the enhancing uh, parenchyma. And for the interpretation of PEM, we either do also a qualitative assessment and a quantitative assessment. In the qualitative assessment, we do this in a way similar to what we do on MRI, where the first step is to see whether the lesion has uptaken the radio tracer or no. And if the up tracer is uptaken, then we assess for the intensity, the homogeneity, the shape of the lesion, the margins, and the associated findings. And actually, a, a, a research article was published as early as 2011 discussing the interpretation of positron emission mammography feature analysis. And they proposed a lexicon uh, similar to the MRI lexicon, but up till now, it, it was not included in the ACR by rats lexicon. Uh, the same authors also published uh, another uh, research article in, uh, concerning the quantitative assessment, and it is similar to the way that we assess PET. We measure the PEM uptake value, which is the PUV, and then we measure the lesion to background value, active value uh, and that is called the LTB. In the quantitative assessment, a suggested threshold value of PUV max greater than 1.9 was considered predictive of malignancies in some, in some studies. While in other studies, they have found it difficult to use a discriminatory threshold for predicting malignancy due to the overlap of ratio tracer uptake. And actually, this is a point of research uh, in, uh, under research in Bahia Hospital. Uh, this is a 50-year-old female with a palpable right breast mass. Uh, she had an irregular speculated hyperdense mass lesion in the, uh, in the right upper inner quadrant. Uh, this was the complementary ultrasound examination, and according to the MDT decision, she was a good candidate for conservative surgery, but the surgeons were, wanted to know uh, with the actual extent of the lesion and the multiplicity. And usually in these cases, we re recommend for a contrast mammogram, and the lesion was, uh, was apparent showing it, it was irregular, speculated, showing heterogeneous enhancement. And this was the PEM of the same patient. And definitely the PEM shows the lesion much, uh, much uh, yeah, uh, more evident than it appeared on the contrast mammography. The measured PUV of the lesion is 4.8 above the threshold for the malignancies. And the lesion to background activity was 8.8, .8, which confirmed a malignant pathology even before doing a biopsy. But the biopsy came back with an invasive duct carcinoma. 
In the quantitative assessment, the, actually the intensity of radio tracer uptake was found to correlate with the increasing tumor grade, which means that well, as the tumor is of a higher grade, it will take up the uh, uptake the radio tracer more than low, uh, tumors of low grade. It was also found that triple negative breast cancers show increased radio tracer uptake, while lobular carcinoma show decreased radio tracer uptake. Uh, the uptake also correlated with the prognosis, whether there is risk of nodal metastasis or no, or whether there is response to new, uh, will, will be response to the new adjuvant therapy or no. And this means that high grade tumors or triple negative uh, breast tumors, they show high radio tracer uptake, but they are expected to respond well to the new adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, this was a, a 55 year old female. This was her screening mammogram and a subtle asymmetry was seen in the right upper outer quadrant. It was a single view asymmetry. Uh, this was how it appeared. And this was how it appeared on the ultrasound. It was an, irre an underlying irregular hypoechoic mass lesion was seen. But unfortunately, when doing the ultrasound to the left breast, we also saw a, a similar lesion in the left axillary uh, tail, which was a subtle uh, uh, lesion uh, area of showing parenchymal uh, distortion. Uh, uh, according to the MDT decision, a contrast mammogram was requested. Uh, the contrast mammogram solved the problem of the right breast because it, sh because it showed intensely enhancing uh, mass lesion in the right axillary tail. But on the left side, there was unexplained skin dimpling and there was only a, sorry, there was only a tiny enhancing nodule seen anterior to this skin dimpling. Uh, PEM was requested and uh, looking at the PEM, looking at the right breast lesion, uh, it showed intense uh, radio tracer uptake with a PUV uh, measuring 2.9 above the, the, the level of malignant lesions, while on the left side there was a uh, corresponding to the enhancing nodule, there was a subtle in enhancing nodule with a PUV value of measuring 0.1, which was very uh, low. Then we uh, assess the lesion to background signal uh, ratio. And uh, on the right side, it measured six. And on the left side, again, it was very low. At, it was 1.1. A biopsy was taken from either side, and the region on the right was an invasive duct carcinoma grade three, and that's why it up it up took the contra the radio tracer. While the lesion on the right was an invasive lobular carcinoma grade one, and because it was a lobular carcinoma of a low grade, it did not take the rate uptake the radio tracer well. The main indications of PEM uh, are mainly to, to uh, enhance lesion characterization in the preoperative staging, to assess the response to new adjuvant therapy monitoring, to assess the, the breast in the post-operative follow-up, uh, in screening for women with dense breast, and whenever we have metastasis of unknown primary. And actually, three of these points are uh, actually under research in Bahia Hospital. This is a 40-year-old female with a palpable right breast mass lesion. Uh, she had a global asymmetry of the right breast, and on the complementary ultrasound, multifocality was suspected. So uh, con according to the MDT decision, we requested a contrast mammogram, and on the contrast mammogram, we saw a multifocal lesion, but we had uh, some adjacent lesions like this area enhancing here, and here we were not sure whether what this was another additional enhancing satellite or no. While comparing what we see on the contrast mammography with what we see on the PEM, uh, the area of uh, concern showed intense uh, radio tracer uptake, confirming its malignant nature. But it, uh, in both modalities, they proved it, uh, the lesion proved to be a multifocal lesion, and it was an invasive car, uh, duct carcinoma grade uh, 2. Uh, this was another screening mammogram of a 43-year-old female, and she had micro group microcalcification in the right upper outer quadrant and another well-circumscribed lesion in uh, the lower inner quadrant. The lesion, a biopsy was taken from either lesions. The one on the top was a high-grade DCIS, and the lesion on the bottom was a fibroadenoma. Again, the surgeons in the MDT were concerned about the true extension of the DCIS, and they, we requested for a contrast mammogram, which failed to show the actual extent of the lesion. Comparing this to what we see on the PEM, the actual extent of the lesion could be excellently demonstrated. Even the lesion was seen extending to involve the nipple area complex. 
that this was another 61 year old female with edema of the right breast, her, uh, her mammogram ultrasound, and even she had an MRI examination, which were reported as, as uh, no mammography findings underlying this breast uh, edema. Uh, PET mammography was uh, requested, and although the lesion was deeply seated, it still was apparent on the PET mammo, showing high PUV values, and a biopsy was taken and revealed an underlying lobular carcinoma. From the advantages of PEM is that it is able to image metabolic and not anatomical changes uh, of, the, of the lesions. And that is because the accelerated metabolic activity of cancerous cells occurs even before the changes in the anatomical structures. Uh, some preliminary studies also have shown a slightly higher specificity and a comparable sensitivity to MRI. And that means that we will have less false positive uh, results. It is a good substitute to MRI when contraindicated. And the rate retracer, because it is entrapped within the cells, it gives us more time for uh, lesion-guided biopsy and for imaging the biopsy specimens as well. And it is also very easy to interpret M PEM, not like the MRI, which is difficult to interpret. PEM also have some drawbacks because the we do not up to now have a lexicon for interpretation of lesions on PEM. Some benign lesions can accumulate radionuclei, and on the other hand, and some other ma malignant lesions show low metabolic activity and can be missed on them. The whole body is, is subjected to irradiation and it, PEM is contraindicated in pregnant and breastfeeding females. And it has some limitations of the mammography like the lesions which are present in hidden areas. And uh, this is an example to show you that uh, an enhanced morphology uh, assessment should go hand in hand with the metabolic uh, uh, information. In this case, she had a two fibroadenomas, which showed intense contrast uptake. But we can still say that these are fibroadenomas beca because we can see the dark internal septations within these lesions. Uh, this was the complementary ultrasound. And actually, on the PEM, they were misinterpreted as false positives because of the intense retrotrain uptake by these lesions. The biopsy revealed fibroadenoma with the complex features. And again, complex fibroadenomas must be surgically removed. So it is not a true false positive because actually it should be surgically removed. And to end my lecture, definitely in the last decade, we have witnessed an intense increase in the volume of breast imaging techniques with the development of new technologies and the upgraded applications of already existing ones. Yet a question still remains with this rapid pace of new development, has the field of breast imaging exhausted itself, or should we still await even higher technical evolutions? And thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Asha, for this presentation. It was very demonstrative with impressive clinical work and research. Um, uh, I would like to go to the questions. Uh, actually, the first question is for uh, Professor Jessica about her lecture and did you come across a rare lesion present in the Thomas census and then at the compression view it disappeared? Um, I think the question is asking that uh, if I see a lesion and um, I look at MLO and I look on the CC and it's a true cancer that uh, it I cannot see on the second view. I think that's what the question is. Uh, I'm not 100% sure of the question, so correct me and please let me know if that's not yes, the case. Yes, so that it's not already there in the two views. It's only in one view and they couldn't find in the other one. And uh, what do you consider it at this time? Okay, so I would do further workup. Um, yes, it is possible that a small subset of cancers can really only be seen in one view. So I would say trust your instincts as a radiologist, as a clinical Position. Trust your instincts. If you think it's speculated, it, if it's irregular, it bothers you. Even if you don't see in two views, I would maybe get a 90 degree lateral, get uh, bold views, um, and use the tomo data to help you find it in another view. Extrapolate that information to do ultrasound, of course. And fortunate for us that many cancers are seen in ultrasound. And that probably answers the question in the majority of the cases. But uh, it's really a case by case. It's hard to answer with a yes or no. But in essence, I would say, well, after you do all that, you still don't find it as unlikely to be cancer. I would still say, always trust your instincts, okay? You can always do biopsy at one view findings now using tomosynthesis guidance. I think the important point of not to have your false positives too high is just to keep track of what you do. Trust your instincts, do the biopsy if it bothers you, but keep track of all the 
all your work so that you know whether you're biopsying too many false positives or not. Okay, I, there is another another phase of the question that's about if we have a case of architecture distortion and on the ultrasound there is no correlate to what you're going to give by rats for this case. Okay, I think that's a relatively straightforward question. I can answer whether yes or no. Okay. And the answer to that would be by rats for suspicions. Um, I showed a bunch of data uh, in terms of the PPVs. They're all over, all higher than 2%. So that means higher than by rats 3. And they're not quite 95%, so not quite by rats 5. So they fall in that broad category of uh, 2 to 95%. So by rats 4 suspicious, even if you do not have an ultrasound correlate. Okay. Um, the Dr. Rania Hgazi was asking about if there is a, the term focal asymmetric density are still there in the field and used, still used? Okay, so uh, the answer is no, it is not used. Okay. I show that in one of my slides and that belonged in the third edition of BIRATS, which was 1998. And I meant to show you just the historical development, how that term FAD, focal asymmetric density, evolved to become a focal asymmetry in the fourth edition of BIRATS, which is 2003. And it was the same term again in the fifth edition of BIRATS, which is 2013. So focal asymmetric density not used anymore, no longer present. Okay, and for another question, do you recommend the extension in incidental radial scar? Uh, and what BIRATS do you give for these cases? Okay, um, this is a very, very controversial topic. Uh, yes or no answer, I would say no, we are not recommending surgical excision of radio scar, but please allow me another minute to explain, okay? Uh, I'm gonna say in the United States currently about 50-50. Half the institutions would, half the institutions wouldn't. Uh, and Society of Breast Imaging is actually sponsoring a symposium in the year 2021 with pathologists and surgeons to get together to have a white paper position on many of these controversial lesions like radio scars, like ADH, like papillomas that you find at core biopsy, what to do with them, okay? Uh, I think that um, we see so many more radio scars now with TOMO. And when I say radio scar, that is okay to not excise. You of course need to ensure that there is radiologic pathologic concordance. And what I mean is, if you have very subtle architecture distortion, like I showed, very fine lines and you get radio scar and that's very concordant, I would say that's okay. But if you get a very angry looking, dense, you know, mass-like radio scar and you get radio scar, a mass-like distortion and you get radio scar, then it's not okay, right? So you kind of have to use your judgment case by case to determine concordance. If you decide it is concordant, I do think it is okay to not excise radio scar and that is our practice currently at MD Anderson Cancer Center. But it is controversial. So when you're in doubt, you can excise and then again, audit yourself, keep track of your false positives. That's not turning out to be cancer. And what BIRATS would I give it? Uh, I would give it a BIRATS 4 until I get through the core biopsy. And then after the core biopsy, it would be a BIRATS 2 benign, assuming it's a radio scar. Thank you for that extra time. Thank you, Professor Long. It was an honor to be part of this uh, event with us. Uh, the next questions will be for Professor Rasha Kamel. Um, about your lecture, what are the contributing factors for classification of risk factors into middle, moderate, and high for these patients? Uh, you actually are going to ask for functional imaging. So when to ask for functional imaging? Uh, are they asking about the classification of the risk factors or the functional? Uh, the, it's it's a, the promotion for the functional imaging that when we find there is a risk factor, so when we ask for extra imaging and when it's, there is no need because there is a mild or moderate risk. Yes, uh, uh, we have, we, we, in, as I said, we generally classify the population into three categories, the average risk, the moderate risk, and the high risk. Uh, 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 there are risk assessment models on the internet where you can go and ask, uh, answer uh, several questions and according to your answers, they will give you a risk, your, a risk assessment, whether it is categorized as average, moderate, or risk. And uh, there is, uh, uh, in general, we say that the high risk uh, uh, individuals are those uh, individuals who have a genetic mutation or a first degree relative with the, uh, the genetic mutation or those individuals who have received direct irradiation to the chest 
while they were young. And some, uh, there, uh, there are some uh, genes which overlap between the cancer colon and the, the breast cancer. And when these uh, uh, patients have this familial type of familial polyposis, they are classified as high risk individuals. The moderate risk individuals are generally the, popu the, the individuals who have had a history of breast cancer, who have a heterogeneous dense breast or has removed excised a lesion from their breast, which was proved to be a benign precancerous uh, lesion uh, or, or the proliferative uh, or a proliferative uh, lesion. Uh, so uh, you can either do this or this. And uh, I explained at the beginning that the average and the moderate risk, we do nothing more than the mammography and uh, screening. And sometimes it is complemented with an ultrasound examination. For the high risk individuals, up till now, what is validated that we add uh, MRI to the mammography and, um, and ultrasound examination annually, and uh, starting at an earlier age. A contrast mammography has the potential to be used, but it is still not validated. It has to be tested more uh, no published literature enough to say to say whether it will fit or no because uh, we are usually dealing with the uh, younger uh, population and we are going to expose this younger population to a, a higher radiation dose so this has to be calculated uh, to calculate the benefit or to weigh the benefits and risks in this condition uh, do you have anything jessica to say about this no i think you answered it very well yes <laughs> thank you <laughs> Well, that, uh, this may pass us to another question about the same issue, more or less. It's when to choose MRI or contrast enhanced mammogram. Uh, actually, I answered this in detail, in detail in the, yes. yes uh, <laughs> most probably it was okay. asked before I uh, answered it, yes. Okay, and would you prefer uh, PEM uh, for, for the MRI? Uh, uh, actually, we are still burning uh, and building our learning curve in the pet, pet mammal. We have lesions, we have cases which, uh, in which it showed uh, uh, yani, uh, superior. Uh, just today, I had a case with a false positive MRI and it was negative uh, on the PEM. We believe the MRI and not the PEM, and it turned out in the post-operative pathology that the PET mammography was, was right. Uh, these lesions were, were uh, just benign lesions, and uh, uh, so we are still uh, building our learning curve and uh, I think I maybe uh, after a few months I can give you a definite uh, answer to this question. There is a relevant some sort of question about the role of breast elastography differentiate between benign and malignant breast masses. Uh, I'm always asked this whenever I give a lecture and uh, actually, uh, although uh, many uh, uh, articles are published concerning elastography, but I think in, uh, in busy places, adding an, an examination like elastography to the ultrasound is a great problem. Uh, it takes a lot of time and uh, yani, uh, additional time is not an option uh, unless you're working at leisure. And I don't think it adds very much uh, like maybe the shear wave will add, uh, will be easier to perform. But uh, uh, yeah, they say that elastography really uh, uh, increases the specificity and the sensitivity, uh, the specificity of ultrasound. But uh, in my work, I didn't find this. <laughs> it it uh, puts a burden without, without that much of differentiation between benign and malignity. Okay, uh, there is a specific question about why biopsy is indicated in case we have a facilitated diffusion. Yes, we have malignant lesions which show facilitated diffusion the same way as we have uh, benign lesions which show a restricted diffusion. Every imaging modalities have uh, exceptions and uh, that's why we, we should look at uh, what we use collectively. It's not only as a solo imaging modality. We get the findings in all the imaging modalities that, uh, that we use and we try to put things together to choose whether uh, uh, to biopsy or to, or to just say that it is a probably benign uh, lesion to follow up these lesions. Um, if there is any role for press CT scan, the PET CT it has a problem in that it doesn't visualize small lesions within the breast. And if we're speaking about the mainly, cons uh, and we are mainly concerned with the small, identifying the smallest lesion within the breast, then we are speaking that we are going to miss more, uh, all lesions which are under one centimeter will be missed within the breast, or most of the lesions below one centimeter. Uh, it's different from the PET mammal. The PET mammal has a dedicated detector that it, two detectors directed to, to uh, dedicated to the breast, it's not like the PET CT, which uh, images the whole uh, body, yes. Okay, Dr. I, Russia, 
Yes. Can I ask a quick question, which is that you showed an impressive array of imagery modalities at Bayer. I'm very impressed with your images, with your access to uh, latest technological advances. Can you make a few comments about cost effectiveness and uh, clinical implementation to the average practice? Uh, yes, uh, the cost effective, uh, uh, yani we don't have this uh, uh, issue uh, to that extent in Egypt. Uh, um, yani the, yani you, you usually have uh, problems in Europe and USA with the insurance and this. Uh, uh, but we, after working with the new modalities for, for uh, a long time, maybe I've been working with contrast mammography for 10 years and or maybe 11 years and uh, with the PEM it's still uh, I'm as I told you I'm still building my learning curve in it but uh, we can now select the cases which is most suitable to do the contrast mammography and who is more suitable to do the MRI uh, based on uh, yani, on what I simplified in my lecture uh, we haven't done cost benefit uh, cost effectiveness uh, studies uh, to be true with you but I think this is an issue that we should consider especially that we are working in a charity hospital. Uh, we may mainly depend on extra funding, yes. Thank you, very impressive. Yes. Mm -hmm. And one last question um, for both of you, for both of you professors. Uh, is it worse to have a BEM without having a biopsy set? And I guess this situation goes with MRI. You know, we have many institutes with MRI and yet we do not have a biopsy set specific with MRI. What to do if we have a legion and it's very small size, it's not obvious by the previous modalities and we still want to biopsy. Okay, sure. Maybe I'll take this first and see what Dr. Kubasha uh, says. Very important and interesting question. Um, in the United States, we have the ACR, American College of Radiology, which does accreditation of our programs. And one of the accreditation criteria for breast MRI is the ability to either perform the MRI, uh, MRI guided biopsy or a relationship with a partner institutions that can perform. Bottom line is that the ACR wants you, if you're going to do the imaging, to be able to or help the patient arrange for a biopsy, even if you don't do it yourself. Um, I think that, of course, first step in many of these cases is go to ultrasound, right? Because ultrasound is a really, really great friendly first step tool and answers many questions. But of course, you're going to have a number that doesn't. And our uh, industry partners are ever increasingly developing biopsy systems for tomosynthesis, for contrast enhanced guidance, biopsy. So all those are either available or coming down the road. Um, I think that don't feel bad if you don't cannot biopsy it, but important thing is to think about it, which you are, because you're ask, asking the question, and is to think about that and take care of the patient. Think about how I'm going to take care of the patient and not just leave it like, I find it, I can't help you, you know, that's it. So I think that whoever's asking the question is already in the right, doing all the right steps because they're thinking about it. Yes, for us in Bahia, uh, Jessica, we uh, we did not get the MRI biopsy sets, but we have uh, a contrast uh, mammography biopsy set, and uh, uh, and we uh, we are in the process of getting also the PEM uh, biopsy set. It's actually both of them. We have both of them, but they are still not working because of the Corona pandemic. We do not we cannot get applicators uh, to teach us. Uh, I believe maybe the most beneficial uh, of the of the three will be the the PEM biopsy set because the radio tracers remains within uh, the tissue. You can do the PEM and then after finishing the PEM, it's not like MRI and contrast mammography where the contrast will disappear, but uh, we still have the radio tracer within the biopsy uh, within the lesion. We will take the biopsy and we can even image the biopsy specimen. Uh, and it will show that uh, the radio tracer within the specimen. But uh, definitely it, the MRI is the, is the most in use now. Uh, we are, but I'll tell, again, I'll tell you my experience after one year from now when we fix the contrast mammography and the pen uh, guided, yes. Okay, uh, I guess we are about to the end of these uh, lectures. I, it's actually very sad that we are going to end this webinar. It's very, it was very interesting. The information was very up to date and to, uh, was very covering most of the fields. I would like to thank you again, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Jessica Loing, for your participation. And it was an honor to be part of our first yes. webinar at Heya, sponsored by the uh, company Global uh, uh, Technology Fujifilm. Uh, and uh, Professor Dr. Rasha Kamal, um, 
she actually my mentor and uh, a long uh, yeah, a long uh, live uh, relation they for, always uh, just they always say that sahar is my daughter although we don't look like yeah. alike <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I would like to thank you. Thank you, of course, the Heya for presenting this webinar, and we are looking for uh, uh, upcoming events and very entertaining and uh, very uh, fruitful events uh, coming on later. Inshallah. And the next time you are in Egypt, uh, you come to Egypt, Jessica, you must visit us in Bahia Hospital. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it will be my pleasure, and hope to see you someday in Houston. And anybody who wants to visit or if you have the opportunity maybe post covid uh please feel free to contact me yes yes thank you thank, thank you, you everybody thank you okay. thank you thank you, thank you. Yes. very good night yes. have a great good night, night. Good.